So at the request of the Broadcasting and Recording Services, members and visitors in the public gallery are requested to ensure for the duration of the meeting that their mobile phones are turned off completely or switched to airplane safe or flight mode, depending on their device. It's not sufficient to just put your phones in silent mode, as this will maintain a level of interference with the broadcasting system. Item today is on the impact of Brexit on Ireland's housing market. Um, today's meeting will involve consideration of the impact of Brexit on Ireland's housing market and on behalf of the committee I would like to welcome from, uh, Mr Tom Healy from the Devon Economic uh, Research Institute and Mr, uh, or, sorry, Professor Kieran McQuinn, Dr Conor O'Toole and uh, Mr Barra Roundtree from the Economic and Social Research Institute to, for, to today's meeting. Before we begin I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of section 172i of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence given to this committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to so do, you are entitled thereafter only to a quali qualified privilege in respect of the evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that where possible you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or in such a way as make him, her or it identifiable. Members are reminded of the long-standing parli parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the Houses or unofficially either by name or in such a way as make him or her identifiable. I would now like to call on uh, Professor Quinn for his, oh, McQuinn, sorry, for his opening statement. Thank you. Um, first of all, let me begin by thanking the Chairperson for the invitation uh, to the SRI to appear before you today. Uh, I'm Kieran McQuinn, uh, Research Professor and Head of Economics. I'm joined by my colleagues, Dr Conor O'Toole and Mr Barra uh, Rowntree. While we have not specifically addressed the impact of Brexit on the Irish housing market, researchers in the Institute have examined the impact of Brexit at an aggregate and at a sectoral level. We have also built up an, uh, an extensive research expertise in the housing area itself. Therefore, our comments here are informed by a considerable body of research. I will start by summarising the results of some analysis which has examined the overall impacts of Brexit on the Irish economy. The macroeconomic effects of Brexit are significant and negative for the Irish economy. Depending on the nature of the UK exit from the European Union, Irish output levels could, by 2026, be up to 4% less than a baseline no-Brexit case. While 4% may not appear like a significant impact, it has to be borne in mind that this impact will accumulate over a long period of time. Therefore, income levels will be lower than otherwise would be the case, and unemployment rates will be higher than a no-Brexit scenario. In the case of the latter, it has been estimated that under a WTO-style exit, unemployment in the Irish economy could be almost two percentage points higher than under a no-Brexit situation. Housing demand. The impact of Brexit on income levels and unemployment are particularly important. When we think of the demand side of the housing market, we think of income levels, interest rates, unemployment and demographics as being key fundamental variables. Across a number of markets, movements in these variables have been shown to be key drivers of house prices. The impact of Brexit on, on income levels and the labour market is fairly unambiguous. Both are expected to be lower than a no-Brexit scenario. In this respect, housing demand is likely to be lower due to both factors. The situation in regard to demographics is less clear-cut. Because Brexit will have an adverse impact on domestic economic activity, it may reduce the number of people coming to work in the, Irish, in the, in the country. This again would reduce the demand for housing and hence result in lower house price growth relative to a baseline no-Brexit case. On the other hand, Brexit could result in a large number of people moving to Ireland from the United Kingdom, particularly if there is a significant fallout for the financial sector in London. This could see an increase in the number of people coming to live and work, particularly in Dublin, which would increase housing demand. Therefore, one could see significant regional differences uh, in the impact of Brexit on the Irish housing market. The rest of the country may be adversely impacted, while the greater Dublin area may be less so. One other issue worth mentioning in relation to demographics is the potential for what we call increased friction in the relationship between the Irish and UK labour markets. By friction we mean anything which prevents people from moving and working in one jurisdiction to another. Traditionally, the UK labour market has operated as a form of safety valve for the Irish economy. When unemployment starts to increase significantly in the domestic economy, people tend to move to the UK to find employment. If this becomes harder to do as a result of Brexit, then it will increase the scale of negative shocks in the Irish economy. Therefore, housing demand uh, will experience greater fluctuations than otherwise would be the case. 
In terms of the flow of mortgage credit, if financial stability risks in the banking sector materialise following Brexit, this could limit the availability of mortgage finance, which could also put downward pressure on prices and subdue demand. Colleagues in the Institute have done extensive research on the implications of Brexit for the production processes of Irish firms. Where this might impact the housing market is any difficulties Irish firms may have in securing relevant materials and labour from the UK market. If Brexit causes a significant increase in the cost of firms securing labour and materials, this will push up the cost of house building domestically with associated implications for prices. This may also extend to financial sector considerations. If access to finance for development becomes impaired due to disruptions in financial markets, then the flow of financing to commercial real estate development may decline if international equity flows moderate. This again could increase the cost of supply with prices being pushed up. Therefore, overall, and notwithstanding the particular case of the Dublin market, Brexit may lead to lower levels of housing demand if income and unemployment effects are considerable and no inward migration boost materialises. The risks to housing supply are more clearly on the downside. At this juncture, it is important to note that housing supply levels are still considerably lower than structural demand, with our research showing this is most clearly the case for lower income households. If Brexit were to result in a lower level of housing supply by the private sector, it is important that the state continues to invest in affordable, affordable and social housing. Brexit-induced reductions in income and employment or increased inward migration to Dublin could also have implications for what will soon be the government's main income-related social housing support for private rental renters, namely the Housing Assistance uh, Payment, HAP. Eligibility for HAP is determined by families' disposable income with maximum limits set on the rent that can be covered. If income and employment growth are slower than anticipated due to Brexit, the numbers of families that qualify for HAP over the coming years will likely be higher than currently expected. Similarly, if Brexit results in greater migration to and so higher rents in Dublin, HAP expenditure is likely to be higher than currently anticipated, while the rent limits set down by regulations may require more frequent revision. These were last revised in March 2017. Rents have increased by 12% in the capital since then. Market expectations. These changes in the demand and supply side of the market have all been discussed in the context of changes in actual economic and demographic variables. However, expectations, both that of consumers and producers, are hugely important in the residential market. To date, the entire Brexit process has resulted in a marked increase in uncertainty in the economy. Greater uncertainty typically makes households and firms more cautious in their decision maker, therefore resulting in less activity in a market such as the housing one. This again is likely to result in lower housing demand and supply. Legacy issues. Finally, let me say something about the particular legacy issues, some particular legacy issues in the housing market. Mortgage arrears is still an issue in the Irish market. While rates have fallen in recent years due to improved economic circumstances, they are still above European averages. Key drivers of mortgage arrears are income, employment and house price levels. As we have already seen, income levels and employment levels are likely to be less than would otherwise be the case, while house price levels will likely grow at a slower pace than compared to a no-Brexit situation. Therefore, the rate of decline in mortgage arrears is likely to slow due to, to Brexit. This in turn will have implications for the non-performing loan levels and the balance of Irish financial institutions, which will impact their performance as well going forward. Brexit may slow the extent to which the European Central Bank, the ECB, wants to normalise monetary policy. If Brexit brings about slower growth across the Eurozone, this may lead the ECB to moderate the degree to which policy rates are increased. Lower policy rates are likely to result in domestic mortgage interest rates being lower than what they would otherwise be. This would improve affordability in the Irish mortgage market as interest rates are a key determinant of affordability. So finally, many thanks for your attention and my colleagues and I will be delighted to take any questions you may have. Thank you very much. I'd now like to call on Dr Healy for his opening statement. Thank you and thank you for the invitation to address this question. Um, let me begin by saying that we have in the NERI undertaken research in the area of Brexit and separately in housing, but in common with uh, other researchers, we have not looked specifically at the possible or likely impact of Brexit uh, on the Irish housing market. In fact, uh, I can find no specific research carried out in this area, uh, neither by the ESRI or by Copenhagen Economics or any other uh, individual researcher who has assessed the economic impact of Brexit in the Republic of Ireland. Uh, 
To put this in context, uh, we are all aware of the uncertainties about the final shape of a Brexit deal. And given that uncertainty, it, it is extremely difficult to uh, make any projections either in relation to the supply of housing or, or the demand. Uh, it is surely the case that consumption and income will be negatively impacted, other things equal. And I think that's an important qualification here that in any economic outlook, we are looking at the effect in isolation of one change, be it Brexit uh, or another factor. But other factors also impact on growth, on demand for housing, for example. And we don't know the evolution of the world market. Uh, many other factors, including the extent to which multinational investment and the state of the domestic economy can affect uh, and interact with demographics uh, and thereby impact on the housing market. So it is possible that economic growth could remain at a high level and yet, we know from the data, from the, ev from the evidence uh, of other research, that Brexit in isolation, uh, in all likelihood, will have a dampening effect on economic activity. My point really is that other factors could uh, outweigh, could actually uh, disguise, in a certain sense, the negative impact of Brexit. Turning to the housing market, uh, the problem here, of course, is that as matters stand, supply is still very inadequate. But we also need to reflect as well on the regional and the compositional aspects of the Irish housing market. Uh, there is a particular um, issue of excess demand in the Greater Dublin area. <coughs> and over and above that, the output of, uh, for example, apartment dwellings uh, is very um, low uh, compared to uh, in fact, it's almost predominantly, uh, it's almost entirely a, a Dublin uh, phenomenon, apartment building, to the extent that it is happening nationally, and that's based on the most recent CSO data. And that is also a factor that makes us somewhat unique in, in European terms, that we have a very particular composition of housing output, either single housing or housing that is part of a scheme. Uh, in many other European countries, apartment um, living is much more the norm, and there is a much greater density of, um, of accommodation in, in large cities. The point there is that Brexit, to the extent that it may impact on inward migration, uh, will increase in all likelihood the demand for rental accommodation and that particularly in the Greater Dublin area and in the other cities. So there are details here in relation to the regional and compositional aspects of the housing market <coughs> that are crucial. Again, in context, I think the, the important uh, lesson here is to be ready, to be um, as best prepared as possible, and it really does underline the importance of good social policy to accelerate uh, the output of new homes, but also over time to adopt a strategic approach to the housing stock and the composition of housing, and also the, the need to change um, the um, insulation of housing, for example, to meet the challenge of climate change and the challenge of, um, of moving towards a zero carbon economy. So what we need to be doing anyway, if there was no Brexit, is all the more the case uh, with the uncertainty and the likely negative impacts of Brexit. Now to focus specifically on the demand side for a moment, as already mentioned, uh, it's the combination of household income effects and migration that, that work on the demand side. Uh, my own view is that it, the, the net effect is probably going to be uh, a higher than otherwise expected demand for accommodation arising from Brexit. Now, I don't think we should exaggerate the um, likely phenomenon of, for example, UK financial institutions relocating to Dublin or other cities. That will and is happening, but it, it, is, it is in the bigger picture of things likely to have a, a limited impact
What is probably more likely to happen is that workers and families and individuals who might have moved to the UK from other parts of the EU are more likely now um, other things equal to, to, to move to the Republic of Ireland. We should bear in mind as well that if tariff barriers were to be erected uh, between um, Ireland as a member of the, uh, of the EU and the UK, uh, including of course Northern Ireland, uh, then it's quite likely that UK companies will relocate part or some part of their activity uh, in the Republic of Ireland. And that's exactly what happened in the 1930s, if you think about comp companies like Cadbury's, for example, that located part of their operation here uh, in the Irish Free State uh, behind newly erected tariff barriers. Of course, as an English-speaking country, uh, with the common law um, uh, system, uh, we do have certain elements of attraction to multinational companies quite apart from the, from the low headline rate, the 12.5% rate. Um, just a, a quick word about the supply side. Uh, one of the issues there, of course, is currency fluctuations and the impact of that on imported materials uh, by the construction sector itself. But also we need to bear in mind that the construction sector uh, is a net exporter of goods um, uh, and that too could, uh, could be impacted were sterling to depreciate significantly in the months and um, year after uh, Brexit uh, actually happens. Uh, there's been a much focus and discussion recently about the way that a customs union could um, limit or uh, attenuate some of the uh, impacts of Brexit and, and, and indeed avoid what people refer to as a hard border, be it in the Irish Sea or, or, on, the, uh, or on the island of Ireland. I think we also have to reflect that it is the non-tariff barriers and the 1001 regulatory standards and product standards and uh, inspection um, issues raised by a divergence from the single market, from the single European market, that matter actually probably more than whether or not there is a customs union. People are very much focused on the visible aspect of trade in goods, but there is this uh, other uh, uh, issue which is much more difficult to measure, and that too uh, can have an effect on the construction industry. So in conclusion, I think that the implications of Brexit is that it, it really does challenge all areas of economic and social policy and we do need to be vigilant. We, we need to do more of what we should be doing already and that includes a much more ambitious uh, approach to public housing building and in our own research we have also proposed a model of cost rental that would actually provide much more choice and um, uh, flexibility in the housing market and could actually be a, a significant game changer in terms of um, ending the dominance of the private rented sector or the dominance of, uh, of a developer-led model. On that point, I will happily take questions or join the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Healy. I'm uh, Deputy O'Brien. Thanks, uh, Chair, and, and thanks for the, the presentations and the submissions. And one of the things when I was reading the papers last night um, was that while there's a whole series of risks, because we don't know how Brexit is going to pan out, we simply have no way of, of knowing or assessing or measuring uh, its likely impact on the housing market yeah. and the housing system. So other than highlighting the risks, uh, and I think both of your presentations today have, have done that very well, maybe the discussion the committee really needs to have is knowing that we don't know those things what are the kinds of mitigation measures that we should be arguing should be put in place so that whatever the negative impacts, um, we're in a better place to deal with them than we are currently. Uh, and whatever one thinks of rebuilding Ireland, and there are members of the committee who are strongly in favour of it, and there are members of us who are very critical of it, the one thing we can say with certainty is it was designed without an eye to the kinds of issues that have been raised here today. So whether we're for or against the plan, I think we would all agree it's clearly something has to change or something has to be added to it to mitigate the measures that you're outlining. So my questions are more about uh, where we go uh, from here. I'm also working under the assumption while both the public and the private sector in terms of house delivery are affected by the negatives, the private sector is clearly 
far more vulnerable to those things. So, for example, while obviously increased cost of construction labour will equally, equally affect public and private sector uh, uh, housing output, the, the difficulties around credit don't have the same impact on the public sector because they're either using exchequer revenue or housing finance agency funds or, or European investment bank funds. Likewise, I suppose the overall developmental costs in the public sector are much more controlled because they're not as dependent on land prices and uh, uh, developer profit and risk, etc. So would it be fair to say then that one of the key mitigation measures is to look at the, the overall output and quantum of public housing, both social and affordable, and to say that given that that sector is a little bit less at risk, it still has risks, that one of the, the I suppose, bre Brexit mitigation measures that could be made is, is to think about increasing the output over a period of time of public housing, social and affordable housing delivered on public land with public finance. Uh, because that way then you might be able to pick up some of the slack that might inevitably come on the private sector because of the, the concerns you have. Do you have other views in terms of the kinds of mitigation measures? Because obviously there's very little we can do in terms of increased demand. Uh, so we remain within the European Union, within the free travel area. So, so whatever happens on that front is going to happen. It's the supply side issues that are clearly a concern and anything which makes it more difficult to supply public or private housing is a concern. So have you other ideas or suggestions or if you don't, are there avenues you think the committee could pursue in terms of future considerations uh, to deal with that? And then finally, like in some areas of government policy and public policy, um, there's been quite significant discussion and debate about the impacts and therefore the mitigation measures. This does seem to be one from what both of your organisations are saying there's been a bit of a blind spot towards. Uh, and in fact, it's only something that's come on our own committee's agenda recently, primarily because of the interest of the chair and others. I, is that really the case? Is there really very little discussion either at the public policy fora level or in your interactions with government and state agencies? Has, have the issues that you've raised with us today not been part of the discussions? Is that a concern? And what do you think we as a committee can do to try and raise the profile of some of these concerns to make sure that whatever mitigation measures are possible uh, and, and, and appropriate get kind of pushed higher up the, the chain of priorities in terms of how uh, government and, and public agencies prepare for Brexit? Thanks, Chair. Excellent. I'm going to take two members um, and then we should be able to get a second round in. Deputy Barry. Thank you, Chair. Chair, the other day, uh, Father Peter McVarry said that he estimates that there are now 500,000 persons living in the state who experience distress on a daily basis um, on foot of their housing situations. Um, we're in the middle of the greatest housing crisis that the state has yet known. Um, I think when Brexit is debated and discussed, we hear a lot about its impact on jobs, the impact on wages, the impact on economic growth. Um, it's not a criticism of the institutes, but it is a criticism of the state that four and a half months from deadline day, um, we're still in the dark to the extent that we are in terms of the impact that this will have on housing and on the housing crisis and on the people who are affected by the housing crisis. Um, it's not entirely an unknown unknown uh, and I note with interest that both the ESRI and the Nevin Economic Research Institute uh, have laid stress on the fact that uh, an important preparatory measure to put in place would be to significantly ramp up the state's investment in social and affordable housing. I think that's an important uh, point or conclusion coming from the presentations uh, today. I have two questions. The first relates to the issue of uh, measuring the effect. Um, because sometimes you can measure precisely but sometimes you'll measure more in terms of it might be within a certain range. Okay? So, for example, when um, discussion takes place on Brexit impacts, we've heard the figure that it could have an impact on 20,000 jobs, potentially jobs lost. Or we've heard the figure that um, 
in particular industries, it could result in wage cuts of between 5 or 10 per cent. I think the figure might have been given in one of the reports here about a depressing effect on growth of perhaps 2 per cent in the case of maybe a more malign scenario. But can, are we in a position to make assessments, perhaps not precise, but more within a certain range in terms of key housing indicators? For example, one of the key points that seems to be pointed here uh, too is the idea of um, an upward pressure on rents. Now, I'm not 100% sure as to what the basis of that is. I understand the idea of people coming in from the UK financial industry and looking for accommodation. I understand a depressing effect on the housing market and more people perhaps looking for rental accommodation in that circumstance. So I, I think I've a broad brushstroke idea of why the upward pressure on rent. But are we in a position to measure it? For example, yesterday, you know, daft.ie released figures, uh, I think 11% year-on-year rental increases, uh, a national figure. So are we in a position to say that this or that Brexit scenario, while having an upward pressure effect on rents, it's likely to be within a range of 1% to 3% or 3% to 5% or 5% to 10%. What's, what's the best case scenario and what might be the worst case scenario there? I don't know whether you're prepared to speculate and I accept that there is an element of speculation about it. But just to give a broad brushstroke idea in terms of range. The, the other question I have relates to the issue of the regional variations, which, if I've listened carefully, is, is something that you've both pointed to as well. Um, um, Dublin, I think, has been highlighted as a city or the greater Dublin area where increased upward pressure on rent might be the greatest, for obvious enough reasons. Um, would you be prepared to comment as to the effects of Brexit on the housing situation as it might pertain to different types of areas in the rest of the country? I mean, obviously a big difference between the Midlands or the west of Ireland as opposed to maybe some of the, the bigger cities outside Dublin. Uh, Galway obviously is in the west of Ireland, um, Limerick uh, in the Midwest. Uh, or Cork in the southwest. Um, um, would you be prepared to make any comment in relation to the likely effect on those cities, for example? Thank you, Deputy Barry. Kieran, I'll go to you first. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, very, very uh, relevant questions, I think, uh, really. Um, in terms of <coughs> excuse me, the mitigation strategies, which I think was one of the first I issues raised, I mean, I, I totally agree with, with Tom's point, and I think the point we are making is there clearly are structural issues in the housing market, irrespective of, of, of Brexit. I think we, we're all very familiar with them in, in the sense that we have this issue that structural demand for housing, as we've estimated it, is somewhere in the region of 25, 30,000 um, units are required. We're only building this year, likely to build somewhere in the region of 18,000, and that, unfortunately, it's not just a year-on-year -year issue. It's, this is something that's been accumulating over a good many years, so that the issue is, is quite significant there. Um, and we've been calling, I suppose, for the last three or four years, really, that uh, you know we observed the, the, the marked slowdown in the rate of, of, of social housing units that were being provided, uh, and that there was an urgent need to address that. Unfortunately, I think when the problem, you know, that that issue accumulated as well over a broad number of years, and again, it's not something that you really can address in any one year, um, uh, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so it takes a number of years to address it. I think the point we made in terms of mitigation is that clearly if there is a, if there is a reduction in terms of private, um, private development or the number of units that's coming from the private sector, then ideally uh, the state would be in a position to step in and escalate the, uh, the level of housing supply that it's providing. I suppose the, and that is the, if you like, the desired outcome. I suppose the only issue in relation to that, and something that I suppose we have to mention, is that clearly Brexit is going to have an impact too on the public finances, um, uh, which ultimately is, is, is what is going to 
more than not is going to fund the increase in, in the provision of social housing. So if you have, a, you know, if Brexit has a significant, uh, significantly adverse impact on the public finances, uh, as it more than likely will if you have a very dramatic Brexit, a, a no deal Brexit for example, or a, even a WTO style Brexit, then that will impact the public coffers. And ultimately then, you know, the public coffers is, is, is where the, the, the extra funding would come from. So, uh, you, you know, you have to take that into consideration as well. I said, ideally, the state would be in a position to step in and in a kind of a counter-cyclical fashion be able to boost and increase the rate of housing supply. But, so that is one consideration just to, to, to raise in relation to that. Um, borrowing by the state from the likes of the Housing Finance Agency and the EIB, or would it be predominantly on the revenue expenditure side? Probably on the revenue expenditure side, I would mm. say. I mean, I haven't thought about it, I suppose, in, in relation to other ways, but I think, I mean, it is just something that you would have to bear in mind in terms of the likely future path of the, the key fiscal metrics, the, the, the deficit, the debt to GDP, GNI star uh, metrics. It's something that you would have to, to take into consideration. I suppose we would also note that whilst, you know, calling for increased expenditure on social housing, uh, and obviously there was, you know, a fairly significant increase over the last year in terms of the recent budget, etc. There is also the additional problem that, given that the economy is growing at a very strong rate, there's a balancing act there to be struck, that you don't want to overheat the economy um, in the context of, of the state spending a particularly large and increasing the, the level of expenditure that it is. So I suppose there's two risks to that, if you like. But certainly I think the point is well made in general that ideally if the state can increase its provision uh, of, of housing where there is a slowdown in the, in the private sector, I think that is a, a desired outcome. You raised the issue as about the, the, you know, whether we would have expected more on this, if you like, uh, in terms of dealing with policymakers. I think, in general, I suppose we, we are a little bit surprised that um, you know, we did the kind of initial macroeconomic assessment using our, our kind of the, the range of models that we have to do the analysis, and I, I refer to the results there at the start, and that there hasn't been more since then. That's nearly two years ago. But I think in part that's been, we can blame, I suppose, the lack of policy, concrete policy proposals that have come out of the negotiations, um, which I think everybody has been struck by. There's just been very little tangible, realistic policy proposals that have emerged that we could look at. Um, but in terms of specifically addressing it, it is something that can be, and this goes again to the Deputy Barry's point, this is something that we certainly could look at. I mean, we have the kind of the models there, if you like, to examine on, for instance, on house bought on house prices, uh, on, on uh, housing supply, the impact of reduced income levels, the, the impact of higher unemployment rates. We can also, we've done an extensive um, amount of work recently looking at affordability across the, the property market. Um, so again, we could factor in those kind of issues and look at, well, what's the implications for affordability if income levels fall, if unemployment rates increase, or even if there is some impact, for instance, on interest rates. So th certainly we can answer those things um, right here and now. Very difficult to kind of give you off the top, uh, top of my head kind of specific impacts on, 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 on the key variables. The one point I would make, though, um, if it comes to something like, uh, if you have a no deal, Brexit, and the, the, the UK simply crashes out uh, of, the, uh, of the European Union. I think you have to hold your hands up there in, in those instances and say that it, it is very, very difficult. Economic models have the strengths, um, but very often they're kind of estimated over periods of relative calm and relative stability, so they, they're used to answering questions in that context. When you get into a kind of a situation that nobody has anticipated, or you know, if you have some dramatic uh, series of events where you know, uh, British planes can't land in the continent or the ports are closed. <coughs> Economic models are, are not hugely relevant in that context, but, uh, you know, th th that's an extreme set of circumstances which hopefully won't come to pass. Um, in terms of the rest of the country in Brexit, I think it's a very relevant point, and, and again, colleagues of ours in the Institute specifically looked at the regional issues. Um, I think they made the point, this is work that Martina Lawless and Edgar Morganrot did, made the point that obviously the sectoral implications of Brexit are very significant in terms of different sectoral implications. So clearly the agricultural and related food processing sector is one that is going to be particularly adversely impacted, particularly if you have something like a WTO type scenario. Um, and in that case, it's interesting to look at the areas of the country that are very heavily reliant on agricultural income and on the agricultural sector. Uh, the southwest, uh, very heavily reliant on agriculture, as we know, in places North Cork, South Tipperary, that, across that, that part of the, the world. 
Uh, and so those areas and those uh, sectors of, of those regions are likely to be particularly impacted. The border regions clearly as well, with their heavy reliance on cross-border trade as well as you know, and, and agricultural trade as part of that. So I think there's going to be key, could well be key regional differences. Um, we made the point in the opening statement as well that whereas you could see an overall depressing effect on the housing market nationally, if you do happen to have particularly high levels of inward migration into Dublin because of uh, you know, issues to do with whether it's the financial sector in the UK and London, etc., then you could have anomalies whereby the Dublin market may be quite different in terms of the overall impact of, of Brexit on it versus the rest, of, uh, the, the, the rest of the housing markets outside of Dublin. And probably that would then stretch to the cities, generally Cork, Limerick, Waterford, probably marginally uh, more different. Uh, the, the impact for those cities would be uh, somewhat different then from the surrounding the, the, the regions and, 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 and the regional areas. So. Um, that would be my other Connor or, or, or Tom. Yeah, let me, let me maybe uh, pick up on two points um, from, from Deputy O'Brien's questions, uh, which I think are, are relevant um, for the work that we're doing. Um, let me maybe reinforce first uh, what Kieran was saying that the research that we published um, earlier in the summer looking at housing affordability, it was very clear at pointing out that the issues in the housing market are, are structural. The, the, the relatively to cyclical. And I think that's particularly important now because Brexit is a cyclical shock as well as maybe changing some of the, the structural economic relationships. But what we've seen uh, from the, the, the financial crisis to now has been a generalised under provision of social and affordable housing in, in the Irish economy. And um, I think certainly what, what we've been calling for in a number of our, our economic commentaries has been a, a, a long-term structural commitment to providing a, a a very large share of social affordable housing, and that is not a cyclical issue. That just keeps happening, and that 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 um, that's that's very clearly evident when you see the data. Uh, for, for example, the study shows that you know um, when you look at the private rental sector, households in the bottom 25% of the income distribution that are in that particular sector uh, are spending you know on average 50% of their incomes, their net incomes on, on housing costs. So it's, it is quite a heavy burden on those type of type of households. And then we, we get a big shock like Brexit and we're asking whether or not our suite of policies is, is, is fit for purpose in terms of the mitigation strategies. Well, I think certainly having a suite of housing delivery solutions that is invariant to the economic cycle allows you to make sure you have a buffer that, that allows you to manage these things. And again, then if we see, uh, because we, we, as Kieran has said, we are well below uh, the structural demand levels in terms of, of the number of completions, if we see that even slowing again, if the private sector faces heightened credit constraints or, or other difficulties, uh, then the state can step in and, and, and uh, possibly ramp up its activity to ensure that we, we are providing this component of the market, um, which, is, which is critically important. Now, one other thing I thought I'd pick up on um, in terms of an area of information that I think would be very relevant to understanding how Brexit may have a direct impact on the housing market, and that's to look at the supply chains in the construction sector and whether or not particular types of products may be affected more relative to, to, to other, others. And, um, for example, just looking at some of the information from CSO this morning, you know, particular types of, of, of product groupings like uh, plumbing, electrical fittings, uh, prefabricated buildings, nearly 50% of our imports of those type of products come from the UK. Okay? So there may be vulnerab vulnerabilities in specific product areas that may make disruptions to the supply chain greater in, in housing than in other areas. And that's something that, while we haven't done detailed research work on, I, I think is something that I could be looked at uh, in, in a lot more detail. The, the reliance on, on um, wood and, and, and sort of wood products as well is quite high in the UK, it's about uh, 30%. So these are sort of structural trading relationships which I think are coming to the fore um, in terms of trying to understand the impact of Brexit would have. You know, for example, uh, if there was a, a heightened tariff regime, what would the, the, the likely impact on these type of products, uh, products be? Thank you, Connor. Um, Dr Healy. Uh, just to deal quickly with the regional question first, um, as already stated, there is likely to be uh, a stronger negative impact outside Dublin, and this also will impact on small and medium-sized enterprises, and in particular the agri-food sector could actually be very severely impacted, uh, so you could 
be looking at very significant job losses, um, much more than 20,000 in aggregate, and the multiplier effect of that, uh, not just in the border areas and, and the northwest of the country, but in the southwest and southeast, uh, where a lot of these enterprises that are heavily UK orientated, for example, would be very adversely affected, particularly dairy and, and beef. So there is a challenge here, I think, uh, uh, because Dublin may actually do uh, well out of Brexit. There is an upside to Brexit, um, but it's much more likely to be concentrated uh, in the bigger cities and, and in particular uh, Dublin. Related to that, there is a risk of inequality, of greater inequality, social and economic inequality, to the extent that, for example, the demand for low-skill workers vis-à-vis uh, -vis the supply of, of low-skill workers, that could be, uh, uh, that could be affected, and uh, wage inequalities could actually be increased if you had a situation of higher unemployment in particular sectors and amongst particular low-skilled categories of workers. So there's a social impact there immediately. The other regional issue that we haven't touched on, but that's very important, and we would be very conscious of this as an all-island research body ourselves, that Northern Ireland, the impact regionally in Northern Ireland will be worse than in any other UK region. Uh, and that, of course, will have spillover impacts, uh, particularly in the border areas, but also on construction, because there is a very close tie between the construction uh, sector uh, in the south and in the north, and, and uh, at the moment there is a certain degree of migration of labour going on. Uh, you can see this in, in many of the new developments uh, that are taking place in and around Dublin. So the impact there uh, is, is possibly quite severe, and we can't underestimate the potential there both for inward migration but also for relocation of businesses from Northern Ireland into the Republic. But we must also be concerned about the impact on housing and on the general economy and society of Northern Ireland itself um, as a region uh, and closely allied uh, to the Republic. Uh, in relation to measurement issues, what, were we surprised that there's been so little analysis uh, in the construction housing area? Well, I don't think so because the work that was undertaken in 2015 by the ESRI pretty much tells you what you need to know about the bigger economic impact or possible impact of Brexit. And let's remember that that was before the Brexit referendum. The Copenhagen Economic Study of February 2018 doesn't really say an awful lot more than had already been signalled uh, in the 2015 uh, exercise. Uh, true, there hasn't been any, anything specific on housing or construction in any of those larger studies, and that certainly is a gap. But the difficulty there, I think, is that we really don't know how this is going to shake out in terms of inward investment, in terms of inward migration. The CSO have projected population on various assumptions on migration, uh, ranging from 10,000 uh, net inward migration per annum uh, up to a maximum of 30,000 net inward migrants per annum up to the year 2030. In my view, they're probably uh, conservative estimates or assumptions. Uh, we could be looking at much higher uh, effects. One final point to, to bear in mind is that public services broadly are impacted, education and health. Uh, so it's not just housing, and all of these factors, of course, are interrelated. Uh, one final point, uh, perhaps, to, to, um, to address is um, the question of how to be ready. And I suppose, really, there are two different approaches that can be taken here, um, or emphasis. Um, uh, groups like IFAC and, indeed, the ESRI would underline the <coughs> importance of prudence and uh, of particularly fiscal prudence because of the uncertainties around government revenue in the light of any slowdown. Um, our emphasis would be a little different. It would emphasize the importance of actually ramping up investment, but targeted quality investment in key areas. And let me just finish by giving one practical example. Um, if you want to order a kitchen from Germany, um, chances are that it, 
The bits and pieces will be transported across the English land bridge. Now we've got to think about how Cork Port, um, Waterford Port, which is connected by rail, Belmont Port, just outside Waterford, uh, Rosslare is, uh, as I understand it, roll on, roll off. So we've got to think about the hard infrastructure <coughs> to enable uh, trade to move more, uh, more freely. We also need to get out of fossil fuels more quickly than we had planned because uh, a big proportion of our oil, crude oil and gas is coming through the UK and we, we do need to be uh, mindful in any case of the need to, to take action on, on climate issues. So Brexit has complicated our lives immensely but it has actually put us, put us up to a challenge on social and economic policy that what we should be doing anyway is actually far more urgent now that, uh, that we are faced with this prospect in five months' time of, of an unknown outcome. Can I just ask a point that he raised there? It's, it's a one-sentence question. Yeah, quick, and then I, I'll get him to answer in the next round. Is that all right? You, you mentioned there that you felt that a figure of 20,000 job losses in the event of a hard Brexit, chaotic Brexit, was perhaps an underestimate and that it could be significantly higher. When you say significantly higher, what kind of... What are you talking about? Well, if you look at the total employment in, in sectors directly impacted by, by Brexit, agri-food, um, chemicals, pharmaceutical is another area, but a different story altogether to agri-food. The point is that you can have a chain reaction which percolates out uh, in a particular region. And bearing in mind the fragility uh, of particularly areas to the northwest of the country that typically have the, the lowest income per capita, you could be looking at a much more negative impact. Now, that may be counterbalanced by more growth and, and uh, inward movement in, in the Dublin area. My point really is we don't know, but it could be much worse than some of those figures that have been mentioned, 20 to 40,000. Uh, I wouldn't be prepared to speculate because there is no modelling underlying this and it's probably not even possible to, in any reliable way, estimate these regional impacts. But it does, again, underline the need to be prudent and ready. Okay. Thanks, Tom. I'm going to take three in the next round. So first, Fergus, Victor and then Pat. So Fergus. Uh, here, look, I'd like to welcome our witnesses and to acknowledge their professionalism and their advice. and. Indeed, over the years, the ESRI have been uh, an independent professional body which is, uh, you know, has been on the button in terms of, of informing public policy and governments and oppositions. I just want to say this, that I think that we have opportunities as well, given the, the appalling vista that faces us with Brexit, to change significant policies. And I think the one that you're identifying there is obviously one is a question of housing and social and affordable housing. And I think the point you're making, and it's one I think which other members here make as well, is that it should always be a constant. In other words, whatever the need is, it should be met. And as the market changes, the government expenditure clearly it should be and is increasing in, in social housing, social and affordable housing particularly. And while I think the figure is somewhere around 18,000 this year, <coughs> it will be, I think, it's expected to be 20 by the end of next year and 25, I think, from about 2020 on. Uh, so I think, in, notwithstanding that that won't be enough, I think you're identifying you know, a key policy issue uh, that we can all agree that there has to be a model for building social funding as a constant, as a key, and that it will always go on, regardless of what the climate is. I think the question there, I would just ask, and it's purely a question, just, I know that in the 30s and the 50s, we seem to have, and I wasn't around for, for most, of the, <laughs> most of the 50s, anyway, I was just born. Um, but uh, the point is that there were significant, uh, certainly local authority build, of, of very fine, actually, very good, solid housing that is lasting today in my town and sure in towns right around the country. And I don't know, I know economics were very bad at that time and the national debt was huge and we had very little impact. So what was the model there? Did you look at that or does anybody look at it to see is there, is there lessons to be learned from what we did then? The, the second issue is, is also the question of, of the opportunities in terms of regional development, as you've rightly pointed out, and I, I think one of the speakers there, I acknowledge absolutely that the North, I believe, will suffer more than anywhere else on our island. 
Um, and I think that the question of a regional development policy in 20, Ireland 2040, in particular with the Sligo Letter Kenny Derry axis and with the Drogheda Dundalk Belfast Economic Corridor axis, that I think that maybe we should be looking at. Uh, and the government investment, which is in principle being planned, uh, must be fast-tracked into those areas uh, be because they will suffer the greatest. And in terms of job migration, I think that there is some evidence, um, certainly living in County Law, the border county, there is evidence of job migration from Northern Ireland to, to my county. And in fact, one of the industries is a pharmaceutical company. I think two of them, in fact, may be. So I, I just think that there will be job losses in the north. Uh, companies that are looking at investing in Europe, uh, that are presently looking at the UK, will probably, I think, that's a benefit should happen to us, uh, particularly, I presume, American investment or English language-based companies who want access to the European market. And I know at the same time that most European countries are very competent and qualified to speak English as well as ourselves. But is there, is there an area where we could change our policy there? Or is there, are there opportunities uh, f uh, f for us in that area? But I think that the, the, the key point is the political instability that could result, particularly because of depressed economic circumstances and increased vigilance in terms of tax collection and visibility. Uh, you know, in terms of the differences between the North and the South, that we really have to concentrate uh, particularly on, on our, on our cross-border relationships and our towns and our cities. And our Sligo's, Letterkenny's, Derry's, Dundalk, Drogheda, uh, Newry, and I think that's going to be key for our future uh, stability. Uh, the, question, the other question I have then is that, the, is that notwithstanding the deficit Brexit will give to our country, North and South, you know, uh, that isn't there a case to be made here, you know, with the European Union, that the, you know, there should be a, the, the, there should be a, a, a benefit to Ireland in terms of recognising these economic impacts, which would be disproportionate uh, in Ireland compared to other European countries, and that we should be looking at, uh, you know, specific. I think the point was made uh, about you know the cost of housing, the cost of materials, and all of that. And if the state, if the state is paying the cheque that the EU, through the European Investment Bank, or what, uh, whatever other uh, way it can be done, that they will recognise our increasing uh, disadvantage in meeting key, key issues which arise because of Brexit. In other words, that there has to be a benefit to Ireland, uh, specifically, particularly uh, above and beyond you know, what we would normally be getting and to recognise that in our, in our housing policy, in our, in, our, in, in, in our economic and in our employment policy. So uh, they're, they're the main issues that, that I see, but um, I, I really think that it's, it's really what's happening in Britain at the moment is, is appalling. It's like, you know, every day you read the paper, you, you're like you're reading, you're going back in some cases to demagogues appearing on the political stage, not just in America, but indeed some beginning to appear in our own country, but like, you know, you know, the stability that is essential for our economic well-being and for our democracy, you know, is not going to be improved by Brexit. But I just, I, I just welcome the, the expertise we have here today, Chairperson, and thank you for the opportunity to ask the questions. Fergus, Victor. Okay, the conscious of time, I'm going to be brief. I have a few comments to make and two questions. And firstly, I want to thank the panel for coming in. And I suppose we all know we don't need to be, we all know in this room that we clearly have a housing crisis and clearly we, I, I was really interested in Dr Healy and Dr O'Toole and Professor McQuinn's comments because you all referred in a really interesting way, in a very pointed way about the delivery of social housing. And I thought that was very, very interesting because that's some, something we, we don't always hear. And here, here we have a sort of general consensus and agreement. And in some way, I won't go as far as say you were critical, but I think it was very pointed, your remarks. And it'll be interesting to look back and to read back the transcript of this meeting, because I, I, I think you're spot on. Uh, and I welcome your comments. And the reality is, we all know that we need to be approximately building or rolling out about 30,000 houses. Someone said it earlier on. Nothing less is going to make any real significant difference. And the reality is, we know that there's a crisis both in, in, in social housing and affordable housing, private, public. There's very little public. It's improving, but there's very little of it. It's not simply good enough. We're not building enough 
public and social and affordable housing. So where does that all fit into our deliberations today? And we're focusing, of course, on Brexit housing market and the impact of Brexit on the housing market. So I want to keep my comments to that. But I, I do think it's important that we, and we acknowledge that you know, Brexit is going to play a very significant part uh, an impact on our economy um, and yes it is going to affect jobs and yes it is going to affect the budgetary constraints, it is going to affect employment, it's going to affect an awful lot of things but from what you're saying in both, in both papers you know, I, I would suggest and I, I think certainly in uh, Dr Healy's paper you possibly suggest here that this demand is going to be most felt in many ways, there are opportunities and I think there are potentially a lot of opportunities for Dublin and the East Coast uh, but it's going to impact on Dublin, where we have our greatest housing crisis in terms of delivery of build, social, affordable, purchase, private, every aspect of accommodation and housing for people. So we already have this, this major demand and we have this impact. And you suggest earlier on, uh, Dr. Healy, in your paper, you, you suggest that Brexit will, all things being equal, possibly boost foreign direct investment into the Republic and with it, inflows of personnel uh, generating greater demand for housing, including rented accommodation. So I welcome any opportunity that Brexit, because in every crisis there is an opportunity. And I welcome the opportunity that we can capitalise on in terms of inward investment, in, uh, you know, inward migration. That that's all has to be positive. We have to be ready and prepared to seize that opportunity. Where the crisis is, is the fact, is how can we accommodate these people? How can we provide these people with homes and housing? So that, that's the real challenge. I suppose just two questions I want to ask you. Have you done any analysis? And I, I know, Dr O'Toole, you talked about the, the construction industry and you mentioned that yourself and you picked that up on previous comments. And have either of your organisations done an in-depth analysis in relation to the construction industry and how it's going to impact on that, both in terms of bringing in product, labour and all the issues that go with that? So the two questions I want to specifically ask you, and I'd ask you to specifically address them if you would, what challenges will the construction industry face following Brexit, as far as you can anticipate, we can't anticipate anything to any great extent, but in terms of your projected analysis of this situation, and what potential effects, if any, will Brexit have on the movement of construction of materials between Ireland and the UK, and for that matter, for the rest of the European Union? Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Pat? Yeah, thank you, Chair. And I'll be fairly brief and try and keep it specifically to the housing section as opposed to the broader <coughs> economic implications of Brexit. I suppose the one thing that's coming through is the uncertainty. None of us know exactly what, what we're headed for. And the other word, I suppose, and this word I've used in relation to Brexit is, is stability is required in, in all markets if, if we're going to try and get out of it. And, and you've, but in relation to housing, I suppose, I think it has been identified in the reports that while other areas of Ireland might be exposed in the broader Brexit situation, when it comes to housing and housing specifically, the area that's under already a huge housing crisis will be further worsened by a bad Brexit, and that is Dublin and the surrounding areas, and maybe other, other um, city centre locations around, around the country. There's, it's no different than anything else, the supply of materials in and out, skills in and out, these are all concurrent issues in, in all sectors of, of, of the society out there in relation to Brexit. I suppose one thing that has come, and it's been clear in my mind, not alone in relation to Brexit, but this has been confirmed here today, that there is a greater need for the state to take greater control in the delivery of social and affordable housing in this state and must have a less reliance on the private sector to deliver that. But taking that into account, one equally has to acknowledge that in a bad Brexit, our economy will contract and uh, fiscal space won't be there for the government to deliver that need for social and affordable housing. Which uh, reverts me back to another point, and think Dr. Healy was here before us before, and you mentioned again the cost rental model. We as a state have to find, for once and for all, an off balance sheet model that can deliver social and affordable housing for this country now and, and moving into the future. So maybe if you could address your comments in relation to the whole aspect of the fiscal space, the off-balance sheet models that I can believe will create a sustainable model moving forward by using the cost rental model or a differential model with a top-up from the state. Because I think as a state, 
The only way we're going to fix the housing crisis is to take greater control of that as a state or as a self, as opposed on the private market. Thank you. Jennifer, you, you're under pressure for time, are you? Uh, yeah, and look, I'll just keep it very short. Uh, thank you, Maria. And I think everything has been said, and, and I suppose, um, you know, I want to thank you for um, the reports today, but really, the uncertainty, we're no further on this time last year than we are now. We're actually, I think, taking, as we'd say, I nearly think we're looking at a, a, a backstop, because it's gone to the stage that we're getting these reports, and they're very good reports, but because of so little, because of the uncertainty, and yet there's no evidence of what is going to happen long term, that like people are really concerned. And you know, in these reports, we speak about um, local authority housing that we know nationally isn't being built. But yet we have our minister coming in every few weeks telling us that there's plenty of money for housing. Um, so at, at the end of the day, I think we have so much confusion. And particularly with all these reports that we're receiving, which again, look, they're, they're welcome. But if you even look, if you even look at Brexit, and you look at, as we have spoke about the farmers, the exports, you speak, then you come then to the other, the businesses, and then you look at the housing. I mean, people are living longer. And what actually happening is, even with with building of houses, and we are not actually, we are not now able to cater with what we have, even before Brexit. And please God, Brexit won't happen. But at the end of the day, like. We can't even handle what we have, let alone handle what we're actually hoping that won't happen. And, and that's my concern in the sense of, like, I mean, I had, I had a public meeting last night and we spoke about, we, I had a lot of elderly people there who feel their needs aren't being met in, through local authorities, through the houses that have been built. There's no two bedrooms, there's no houses being built for people with disability. We have to look at the insulation, all, all these issues that are concerns now let alone when Brexit, let alone with, with reports on the uncertainty of Brexit. So, so what I'm saying is, like, what are the answers? Like, we can do as many reports as we want and, and they're all welcome, but what are the reports that are going to come to us and say, well, if it does happen, this is the answers? Because with all the uncertainty, people are, are actually saying, well, if it does happen, what, what, where are we going? You know what I mean? Like, like what, what plan of action have we in place? And we've, even, we've spoke about like mortgages and you're saying that like, there could be a good effect on mortgages, that the interest rates could drop and all that too. But, but, and that's welcome in, in that sense. But when you look at the cities which we're basing on and you look at rural Ireland, rural Ireland is totally forgotten now as we speak. Um, and and that, that is an issue, and we always base ourselves on Dublin, and I know we have homeless is a lot a bigger issue in, in Dublin and, and cities than it is in rural Ireland. But like, we need to look at all these. And, and I just think, again, in reports, again, they're all based on the cities. They're based on Dublin. Rural Ireland is forgotten. And unless we get the, the, to make sure that this uncertainty for all of us going across the country is that all of us will play a part in this, not just the cities, like you were saying there that the cities might actually, it, it, could, it could help a bit in cities if, this, if Brexit is, uh, you know, could have a good impact. But what about rural Ireland? And what, what are we putting in place? And I know you're, doing, you're, you're giving great figures here, but my question is, what are going to happen to the rural Ireland? What is going to happen to people in general? And what do you see would maybe in some way give people some bit of, maybe, Clarence on what you think would be the help to the people of Ireland if this did happen. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, Tom, I'll go to you first this time. Okay. Um, so just to maybe deal first of all with the question raised by the Senator about the rural uh, impact. Um, yes, th there's forgetting about Brexit, uh, there is already a huge challenge. If we think about, for example, the um, the imminent closure of uh, certain peat burning or coal burning stations, for example, the impact on the Midlands, uh, and then further down the road, the money point situation in, in, in Clare. Uh, we're talking about uh, a very significant number of jobs and community impact there. What's noticeable uh, in many cases in, in a rural Irish setting is the extent of one-off housing the extent of reliance on solid fuel or fossil fuel forms of heating. Uh, car dependency is a huge issue. I mean, you basically can't live without dependence on a car to get to and from uh, key services and shops and, and, and workplaces. So this is the point really 
with Brexit, it's all the more reason why we need to invest in public transport, um, why we need to invest in reskilling uh, some of those workers who are going to lose jobs one way or another. And it's always a feature of economic change that jobs are lost, jobs are created. But it's not even, it's, it's, it's very um, uh, imbalanced. Uh, one of the ideas that would be relevant to this discussion, I think, and also in the negotiations about Brexit, is the importance of what I would term a Northwest Development Bank. I don't mean Northwest of Ireland, I mean Northwest of Europe. And in terms of negotiating a transition through Brexit uh, to deal with job losses and some of those issues you've raised in relation to the uh, rural areas of Ireland, uh, such a development bank modelled on the KFW in Germany would lend and advise and help SMEs to reorientate their activities, but also to undertake new activities, and that could involve a radical retrofitting of over half a million houses um, uh, to begin with, uh, and many of them in, in rural areas, badly insulated, and um, all the technological possibilities that are there now in terms of solar power and wind power. So to come back to the question of construction, the Senator also asked about, in summary, what are the impacts? Well, I can summarise them as follows. In all likelihood, higher costs, possible temporary shortages of materials, uh, continuing pressure on skills, probably made worse by, by some of these adjustments, and uh, uh, we don't even know uh, whether availability of skilled labour from Northern Ireland will be assured uh, post-Brexit. And then the net effect on demand, probably greater demand, even though it will be also dampened by economic slowdown in some areas and sectors, but the net effect is probably greater demand. All the more reason, uh, in conclusion, to have a European cost rental model that provides greater choice, uh, greater security, greater affordability and greater quality accommodation, not just to those in need of what we call social housing, but all income groups. Uh, so this idea of mixed income groups in public housing, uh, but doing it off balance sheet uh, is, I think, one way. It's not going to solve all our problems, but it is one important part, I think, of tackling the housing crisis. Um, thank you, Mr. <coughs> Kierlock. Um, so, just there's a few questions there, I think, related to how do we find a model of financing housing development, that, including your own, WKC, that can be kind of sustained through a downturn and if there's a hit on revenues. And I suppose there's a whole set of reasons that can limit the ability of local authorities and approved housing bodies to build. But one of the things that I think have been highlighted by Michelle Norris and UCD, among others, is the fact that rents received by councils are often extremely low in a lot of counties because they're capped by the differential rent scheme in a county. And maybe that's something that's kind of in the background, but interacts a lot with, if we're thinking about how do you get approved housing bodies or, or local authorities to be able to finance housing. If, the, if their revenue stream is really restricted by a very low capped rent, well then they're not going to be able to raise the finance themselves, and it's, you know, if it doesn't even cover the cost of maintenance, it's going to be difficult to get them to invest and it reduces their incentives there. So I suppose that's kind of one set of issues particularly under the, that fall under the, the committee's, I suppose, remit to look at in terms of is there things that can be done there with the differential rent schemes that operate around the county at the moment there, you know, they perhaps aren't particularly coherent across counties. The definition of income differs a lot. The, um, the way that people's means are assessed for those schemes differs wildly. So that's probably one thing that kind of often falls under the, I suppose, under the radar, but is important when you're thinking about is there ways to build that finance model that can sustain housing throughout? So, just come in on that. Yes. Yes. Just clarification back on that. Just, uh, just you can ask the question and we yeah. come back later on, because yeah. Dara and Marie have still have to get in. So yeah, I know just that, but coming back in response to it, I mean, that's a, that's a challenge. And, yeah. and uh, yeah. the reality is that we have capped rents for a reason, yeah. because people can't afford to pay rent. And, you know, I, I'm not, not, no disrespect to you, uh, Mr. Rowntree, but, you know, the, there's the... I think it's an argument for another yeah. day. No, but it's true. No, but, no, sorry, no, hang on yeah, here. But, here, look, it was raised on the floor, yeah. it's a very pertinent one, and uh, in light of like the, the highly qualification of these people here, uh, professional as they are, and I respect you all as professional people, but there are a lot of people who can't pay rent. No. And any suggestion 
any suggestion that there be I don't change or deviation. Senator, in all fairness, can I just intervene yeah. at this stage? I don't think there was any suggestion about the differential. Just yeah. uh, the weakness in the differential that we're in system. We have spoke on this before here, where okay. you know, where we spoke about the differential needing a top up from the state directly if local yes. authorities are going. But to that's very different from a top up, but not the, the tenant Anyway, itself. listen. I want to get through the first round of questioning, if you don't mind, yeah. and then we can come back a second time. Well, this Dara. is actually the second round of questioning. No, Dara hasn't yeah. come in, or Marie hasn't come that's in. That's fair yet. enough. Yeah. All right. So that's I'm trying to get them in first, Victor. Yeah. Uh, here, look, um, I would have thought it is common practice that, that people who present to our committee as well are entitled to their own views, whether one agrees with them or not. Absolutely. And I think, well, yes, so, and that has been practiced for as long as I've been in this house since 2007. So I think the, the purpose of this, I think, though, what Senator Boyne was saying probably points to a, a maybe a, a bigger issue with the presentations and the discussion that we're having is that, and apologies for not being here for your presentation, but I have read them both. I read them both yesterday evening at another meeting, but I wanted to come in to discuss some things, is that the papers that we have here are probably housing papers that mention Brexit, as opposed to Brexit housing papers. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples. That if one was to remove the word, um, let's say, Dr Healy, from your own submission here, you've highlighted some very valid issues with regard to housing policy, housing delivery and the type of housing models. They would still be pertinent whether Brexit was happening or not. Um, and I think the same, and that's not a criticism, I think it shows the crossover of us trying to grapple with what would be the specific effects on the housing sector. So if, based on Brexit, but in particular a hard Brexit. Now, to be fair in relation to um, the SRI's presentation, you've given some specifics around what you see the increase in the in unemployment would be based on a, on a hard Brexit or a no deal scenario of around 2%. I would disagree with other senators that here, with one of the senators that say that there are opportunities here. I think the, any opportunities out of Brexit are far outweighed by the negative impacts that would be there. A couple of specific questions, because in both of the submissions I'm just wondering why they maybe weren't mentioned because when we're supposed to be talking specifically about housing, and maybe you did an answer to, to questions. But the common travel area is, is obviously will endure whatever happens. So when we talk about, uh, when we talk about let's say, a risk to labour, and it was mentioned in one, of, in one of the submissions about the UK being used as a valve to switch on or off, depending on, on, on economics, I think even if you look at what has been discussed between the European Union and Britain about the reciprocal rights between British citizens and EU citizens. I'm not sure whether, I'm not sure how, why that plays such a prominent role in, in both of, of your submissions here and why the CTA isn't mentioned if we're talking about a threat to, to the workforce from the north. Okay, and maybe it was and I've missed it. The All-Ireland electricity market as well, and in particular the East-West interconnector, it's a major piece of, of infrastructure when you talk about housing delivery of new homes and existing homes in relation to energy security. Again, I'm, maybe it is, but I've, I've, I've read both of them. I don't see the, the interconnector, the north-south energy market uh, mentioned in it. Uh, another area would be when we talk about the increasing costs of building, and we know the issues that are there already, which Dr Healy's gone through and, and the SRI, uh, Mr O'Toole, Mr McQuinn and Mr Rowntree as well. But when we talk about a potential increase in cost of material, have any of your institutes done a, a, any work along what level of material is actually imported from Britain? Or are you talking about the fact that it actually comes through the British land bridge fundamentally? Or is it that we're overly dependent on British mater material for building products? Again, I think that's a building-specific Brexit issue that maybe you have information on, uh, that maybe if you do, uh, that you could share it. Because I think really what I'm looking for and what I've been asked, and I'll conclude on this, and I have put questions to, to Minister Murphy by way of parliamentary questions, is has the, government, has the Department of Housing Planning and Local Government any housing-specific or contingency plan based on a hard or a difficult Brexit scenario? And they don't. So um, that's an issue. But again, I think it's something, it, it's a difficult, it's a difficult uh, one to grapple with because we're in a housing crisis. So a lot of the things that you've mentioned in both your submissions are absolutely valid, uh, but are valid whether Brexit happened or not. And I'm just trying to get where's the Brexit specific pieces uh, around 
the percentage maybe that we're dependent on the British market to deliver, building be that true, material be that true, uh, personnel and human resources, our energy security, which obviously would, would affect it. I know you've mentioned, Dr Healy, fuel and fuel importations as well. Gas, I know we've less of a dependency now because of, uh, be, because of the carb right now at the moment, and maybe you have mentioned other renewables. That's not a criticism. I'm just trying to get, get under, the, under the bonnet on this to see we're a housing committee. Okay, you've mentioned housing issues that are there already. What extra happens because of Brexit? And I, I, I'm at a loss with some of it here. Sarah, um, a lot of the benefit of going last is a lot of the questions have already been asked. But um, just in particular, because this is a report that we want to do and we want to get very definitive answers if, if possible, um, is what effects could Brexit have on the building costs and on completions? Would, there, would you expect a delays in completions? Um, and particularly if the UK were to leave the single market or the custom units or if there was no Brexit, what impact on cost of materials do you see there or in delay in materials? Um, and I'm delighted, Tom, you mentioned about um, uh, wood products, that 30 per cent are coming from the UK, and around rapid build, electrical and plumbing, uh, a lot of those materials, 50 per cent are from the UK. It's kind of more detail like that would be of great benefit. If you don't have it here today, that's OK. If you could send it on, that, that would be really helpful. Um, I and mean, in relation to uh, infrastructure, and obviously 2040 outlines the next 10 years where investment is being put into infrastructure like our ports, our tier one and tier two ports. Is there further infrastructure that now that you would prioritise? And if so, what is it and where is it? Um, and around the skill shortage, I think that encompasses whether we have a Brexit or we don't have a Brexit, it's kind of, kind of covered in those areas. Victor, did you have a supplementary you wanted to throw in? You're OK. Perfect. Um, and Owen, thanks, Victor. Owen, I know you have a supplementary you want to throw in. A quick supplementary for Kieran. Um, Kieran, just again to go back to the mitigation measures, and you were saying if if one of the consequences of some of these risks is a reduction in private sector supply, it might be prudent for the state to increase its delivery. As you know, Rebuilding Ireland is to deliver 136,000 social tenancies over its lifetime. 40,000 are uh, properties built or bought by local authorities and approved housing bodies. 10,000 are private sector units leased over the long term and 86,000 are private sector units leased over the short term. So that means 71% of those are private sector units. Given what you've outlined in terms of the risks, do you think it would be prudent, <clears throat> particularly over the next two to three years, to revisit that balance, that 71-29 public-private split of rebuilding Ireland, uh, to take account of the positive negative impact uh, on private sector output? Thanks. Do you want to come in, Connor, first? Sure, let me, uh, so, so let me maybe uh, make some comments on, on a broad set of themes that a number of the, the deputies and senators um, ha have, have raised. Let me first uh, address the, the questions that, that uh, Senator Boyan uh, raised, which, which directly relate to, to Deputy O'Brien's uh, comments. Um, so what challenges would the construction industry in particular face? And um, so, so obviously, the, 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 we haven't done a specific study on the, on the import uh, content of the Irish construction sector, and that's something I mentioned earlier would be certainly an area that warrants our future research. Because if you think about um, the, the, what, in a day-to-day -day perspective, what could happen after a hard Brexit is that those direct trading supply chain linkages are, are disrupted. Um, it's very hard to know the degree of disruption because that will depend on what the tariff arrangement will be in place in whatever deal or no deal scenario uh, uh, comes, uh, comes to, 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 to pass, as well as the, the non-tariff barriers, so the regulatory alignment or, or the, the, the types of, of, of standards that would be required between the, the two jurisdictions uh, following the, the, the deal. I had mentioned a couple of figures earlier about the dependence on specific import types, for example, 50% of imports of the prefabs, plumbing, electrical fittings uh, and fixtures okay. from the oh, UK. Yeah, and kind of yeah exactly. I just didn't see it in that. Yeah, so, so what I mentioned earlier was that uh, looking at some of the, the merchandise imports from the UK to, to Ireland in 2017, 45% um, 40 of our total imports of uh, prefab, plumbing and electrical fittings fixtures came from the UK in 27, so that's 50% nearly of our... our Electrical and plumbing. Exactly, yeah, yeah. And uh, up to about 30% of cork <coughs> and wood products, and, and, and manufactured wood products, 
imports came from the UK in, in 2017. So there are quite a lot of, yeah. of reliances in those particular types of, of, of structures that would be building construction or, uh, oriented. Um, a couple of other risks that, that to, to maybe just point out at this time would be, obviously, if uh, construction firms um, face difficulties in the credit market, raising capital or, or financing in, in a, in a post-Brexit uh, uh, environment, that could be a particular constraint to their activity and the ability to deliver units. Um, on a related financing point um, in, the, in the mortgage market, uh, obviously, if uh, the banking sector is hit with a financial stability risk, a material financial stability risk, they may have to pull back on some of their lending activities. That would both affect the construction firms, but it would also affect the demand side of the housing market if mortgage availability was to, was to, uh, was to lessen. Now, I know some of the Irish banks have large activities in the UK, so they could be exposed to some of the, the, the major financial stability risks uh, in, in that context. Let me make uh, one, one final comment on uh, a basket of, of, of points raised by uh, Deputy uh, O'Dowd as well as um, uh, Deputy Casey on whether you know, the model for delivery of the particular type of units in the social housing. I think um, one of the things we, we've learned uh, from the crisis and from thinking about the type of policies that would be uh, appropriate to have a system that can react whenever different shocks occur, would be not to have a particular over-reliance on one delivery solution. So, for example, uh, if we think of the local authorities, the approved housing bodies, and, and other models of private sector cost rental or other delivery of cost rental, these all have to be part of a basket of solutions that can have a very healthy functioning market that can withstand shocks and downturns, be it Brexit or, 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 or other shocks. Uh, and certainly, I think so the, the research that we published back in June would suggest that having a range of delivery mechanisms I is the most appropriate for any market to, to, to function well, and that uh, when you have a, a, a shock like Brexit, this, is, this would be exacerbated. Uh, the requirement to have a statement. Just on the energy thing, has anyone a comment on the energy piece or did I miss that? Did you mind? Yeah, just... yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, in the original, we, we did a scoping out exercise on Brexit back, I think, in 2015, late 2015, 2016, and the electricity issue was explicit, and the energy issue in general was explicitly dealt with in a paper by, I think it was John Fitzgerald at the time, okay. and uh, Edgar Morganroth. Okay. Just to go back, if we make two brief responses, um, Deputy. Go back to the issue about the common travel area and labour. That, that again was explicitly dealt with in that in, in that previous. in that okay. piece as well. It was there was a series of around four or five chapters. Okay. One was looking at the overall macro issue, and then there was the kind of subsectors, if you like, uh, looking at issues like energy and, and labour. I think the, the crucial fact, though, about the labour market is, I mean, if there, like we're used to a situation where there's been a highly fluid relationship between the UK and the Irish labour market, and that's something that we've seen economists typically refer to it uh, over the years. I think the issue is that if that is in any way impeded, if there's any, as we call them, frictions that prevent people from moving back and forth, whether we like it or not, it, the UK has acted as a kind of a, yeah. a safety valve when yeah. we've had a particularly bad economic shock here and unemployment rates tend to escalate very sharply as they did back in 2009, 2010. We see people moving to the UK and that, whether we, you know, again, whether we like it or not, that tends to put a, a cap on the degree of, of unemployment that we witness in the domestic market. Now, the point we're trying to make is that if that safety valve doesn't operate to the same extent, then the scale or the magnitude of the shock is going to be greater in the domestic market than it would otherwise be. Uh, to go back on the social housing provision, uh, I mean, I think, and again, just to reiterate the point that, that Connor has made there, I suppose if we've learned anything over the last 10 years, it really is that, you know, we haven't looked into it in great deal. I don't think very few people have looked into it in great deal as detail as to what is the most efficient, cost-effective way of delivering a certain number of social housing units. I, I think it's something that should be looked at, to be quite frank. But if, if we've learned anything over the last 10 years in this country, it is that you really need to guarantee, you know, however way you do it, the state, local authorities, etc., you need to guarantee that a certain number of units are built every year. The, the huge problem that arises is that when that breaks down over a number of years and you end up with this huge backlog of a problem which we have, which ultimately will require an awful lot of money to be spent in order to solve the problem. 
uh, and, and you know we obviously have to be careful about how that money is spent and when it's spent, etc. But I, I think that is the, the, the number one lesson. Interestingly enough, we're not the only ones. The UK has had this problem. We, we were talking with colleagues recently in, in the National Institute. You know, the whole issue in the UK in the 1980s when they had the selling off of, of, of the public housing stock. Um, it, it, whilst it was, it, it was very positive for many of the households concerned, the problem was that that public housing stock wasn't replenished, and so it led to a, a, a decline in the amount of public housing that was built. And again, they've had long-standing problems in the UK market as a result. So, it, the, other economies have had this problem, but it is one we need to learn and, and uh, need to heed the lessons of. If you go back to when we were building, you know, the crazy number of houses that we were building back in, in 2005, 2006, and we were building 70 or 80 thousand units per annum. One of the ways that we were looking to deliver social housing at that time was this notion that a certain percentage of them uh, would be provided by the private market. And, you know, that's fine providing 10 percent of 80,000 units if, if you are building 80,000 units, but the problem is that that model collapses when you're building practically, when the private sector is building practically uh, no housing units. So, as Connor said, I think it is very important that we have a, uh, you know, a mixed response uh, so that it's, 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 it's more uh, robust to the type of economic shock, but there must be some underlying guarantee there that the state will provide a so certain number of housing units year on, year out, and that withstands most economic shocks that, that, that occur. Um, I'm just looking through some of the other policies, I mean, or some of the other questions. There was a, a question, I think Deputy O'Dowd raised about opportunities from Brexit. Um, just again, there's some research that colleagues of ours did, again, as part of, um, I, um, I think it was either the scoping out exercise or subsequent analysis that was done, looked at FDI inward flows, which may arise. They did note, uh, this is work, I think, by Ron Davies in UCD and, and a colleague of ours, Yulia Sheedslag, did note that there was some increase uh, in inward flows of FDI as a result of Brexit. Uh, but I think generally, overall, within the broader context, it was still very much, it didn't outweigh the, the, the negative um, the negative uh, aspects of Brexit. So, um, but that is research that was published in terms of the uh, inward flows and possible opportunities, if you like. Thank you, Karen. Barr, do you want to come in? Okay. Tom? Uh, just to address the common travel area question, um, I, I think the honest answer is I don't know because uh, we, we have three interfaces here. Uh, we have an interface with, with the north, with Northern Ireland. We have an interface between the island and the next island, Great Britain, and we have an interface with the continent. Now, when you add up all the proposed backstops and the factoring in that a major reason for Brexit was, was concerns about migration, this doesn't all add up. Uh, something's got to give somewhere. So if we have a common travel area with the next island, we're not going to have a common travel area with the continent. Um, if we have a, uh, some sort of a common travel area around the frontier of the EU, then there will have to be some controls on the border between the north and the south. So something has to give somewhere, and of course that will impact on those <laughs> workers coming south every day uh, to work on building sites and developments uh, here in the south, you can see them on the M1 motorway and, and other places. Uh, there is another land bridge that we haven't talked about, and that's the land bridge involving the road up from Ochnacloy to Straban. It's known as the A5, and um, our fellow citizens in northern Donegal um, are connected by a slender uh, slice of EU territory uh, south of, of um, of Bundoran, and uh, that's a serious point for people living and working there. Many people living and living in, in Donegal, working in Derry, and vice versa, and, uh, uh, and, and in many other areas around the border. So I think there are major unanswered questions there um, uh, to which not even the British Cabinet, uh, as it meets, is it today or tomorrow? Uh, I think it's tomorrow, have, have um, uh, a definitive answer. I think it will take many years for all of this to unravel, and the only way politically to move forward, I think, is to develop a sufficiently broad fudge that everyone is more or less on board, or shall I say, enough people are on board to get it over the line in 27 parliaments plus the British Parliament. And, and then, of course, there is the question of the, the Belfast Agreement, 
the, the, there is no mention of economics in the Belfast Agreement, the Good Friday Agreement, because it was just assumed that the EU would make everything possible in terms of markets, in terms of uh, convergence and the, the, the movement towards an all island economy. Brexit has changed everything and the Good Friday Agreement is not the same, at least it's not premised in the same way uh, as it was in, in 1998. Um, finally, someone asked about uh, what should we prioritise? Well, I think uh, we should prioritise education, skills, retraining, investment in hard transport, uh, public transport, uh, I mentioned ports, but also I think we need to get that fossil fuel import dependency rate down pretty quick from 85% where it is at the moment to something much lower because we are very vulnerable and we cannot uh, put all our eggs in one basket and an interconnector to France would help, but that's not going to happen, I think, anytime soon. And I think we've got to look to native sources of renewable energy to replace some of that external dependency. So lots of challenges, lots of unknowns. I wish I could give more uh, uh, certainty and uh, around some of these estimates, but we are dealing with a very, very uh, fast-moving situation. And inside of all this, of course, Brexit is only one thing that's changing. We've got climate change, we've got geopolitics, we've got a possible breakdown in the multilateral trade system. And all of that actually probably will matter more in the long term than Brexit. So we're talking about one of many different challenges here. Yeah. <laughs> Dismal science, not for nothing. <laughs> thank you, Tom. Um, members, on behalf of the committee, can I thank you all for attending here today? It's a fascinating subject. We could probably keep here for days if, if we could. But um, if there is any further information that you think is relevant to the report that we are doing, we'd really appreciate if you might forward it on to us or, or keep in touch anyway. So, members, can, um, this meeting will now adjourn, and the next meeting will be tomorrow morning, which will be held at 9 a.m. and social housing, financing, enhanced leasing, and land initiatives and PPPs. Thank you, members.